And on the subject of counter-terrorism cooperation in particular, interestingly, in the world, especially the post-9-11 world, counter-terrorism cooperation effectively forms a parallel level of diplomacy that often follows the trends of overt diplomacy, but is, of course, responsive to the logic of the nature of the threat and the size of the threat. A very cursory glance at the roots, and, of course, as we've heard from both the first two speakers, the, the sheer scale of the infrastructure construction means that the scale increases the number of fixed targets, as we've heard about the likelihood of actually meeting the deadlines, means that there will be a permanent series of targets across an extremely long stretch of land. Counterterrorism cooperation will inevitably deepen because of the increased nature of the vulnerabilities of the investments these respective governments, mainly the Chinese, are putting in. Now, I want to round off very quickly with a different approach to looking at the security implications. We've looked at the local, and I think for all governments around the world, including ours, including the US, security calculations really do boil down to two parallel sets of calculations, one of which tends to relate to counterterrorism, to militancy, the other to classic interstate diplomacy. And I want to end with the interstate diplomacy consequences of deepening bilateral ties and interdependencies between Pakistan and China. Not the creation of a new alliance, but the deepening of an existing alliance. And that's why I don't think the implications for regional security are quite as great as you might think if you just look at the numbers. And I want to bring up something which is actually very important, which is a Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Very important. I didn't realize, because I've been in Ukraine land for this time, that in July last year, at the summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, India and Pakistan began the process of upgrading their observer status to membership. Now, I think the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is still a relatively misunderstood, I think, entity as far as the West is concerned. There's a lot of literature that demonizes it and says, well, it's just a, it's a NATO, it's the West and the rest. They're banding together against us. I think that's rubbish. I think it's obviously, given its name, something that brings countries in the region around China's orbit. But since its inception, it's still very new, 1996, is its, um, I think, its inception, it's really had a sort of a twin engine, China and Russia. And the bifurcation, broadly speaking, has been, of course, Russia has had the hard security power. It's a nuclear armed power, you know, massive army, much further, I think, down the, the, the road of advancement 10, 20 years ago. And China was, of course, the economic powerhouse, and China did the development side of things. So if India and Pakistan do join this, the SCO, what will happen? Well, I think one thing that happens is that the Russians have backed the Indians, the Chinese have backed the Pakistanis. This is actually quite a good thing because the SCO has based a lot of its work around counterterrorism cooperation anyway, admittedly very self-serving to the Chinese and to the Russians because after the Soviet Union, the separatist movements that took root, of course, in the Central Asian republics that were then newly formed, and the worry, especially from the Chinese, that the Central Asian republics would export, for example, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, for example, its links to Xinjiang separatists, export that separatist mentality. There's, of course, Uzbeks and others who have been found in Afghanistan on a regular basis. That sense of the global jihadist sort of threat and linking the Xinjiang separatists more directly into the global network and movement of hardcore jihadists. But I think in terms of regional balance of power, um, the SCO sometimes has to persuade itself that it is simply not a clearinghouse for gas deals. It can, as anybody who's ever been involved in multilateral diplomacy, and I say this having been involved with the OSCE, sometimes these multilateral endeavours are just so unwieldy that they don't actually seem to, in terms of their direct mission statement, if you like, ever do anything. But they are forums in which the finance ministers, the security ministers, intelligence chiefs meet on a regular basis. And I think there is a lot of competitiveness, there's a lot of outbidding in this region because of the nature of the borders, the nature of the resource arrangements, the possibilities of different energy flows. I actually think it's a very good thing that India and Pakistan would be both brought into the SCO. I think it's a good thing because it brings Chinese potentially and certainly Russian pressure to bear on such issues as Kashmir, on such issues as India and Pakistan having to cooperate to at least some extent in the various endeavors that they're either by implication or by design um, involved in. 
So to round off the security um, implications of the CPEC, I think locally, in terms of the people of the region, very big actually, very big. They can exacerbate that sense of feeling out of the mainstream for some. Even the more people are brought into the mainstream, the more you might fall out. That's the real danger. And I think regionally, I think there are a lot of gains to be had, and I think the actual consequences won't be as great because the China-Pakistan alliance, although not codified, has been a reality in the region for a very long time already. I actually think the SCO um, and its expansion is probably the trend to watch there. So I'll round off there. Thanks. Thank you very much for the stimulating presentation. <coughs> is there any one burning question? I'll take it. I'll, yeah, um, yes. Uh, uh, I wonder if, um, if, for consideration, the fact that Gilgit Baltistan, through which this corridor will run, uh, I mean, officially, it is a part of India. And Pakistan occupies it illegally, according to the United Nations. And I wonder if, if the issue itself will ever come before the United Nations to, to discuss the legality of it. Okay, so what you said is technically not true. Um, now, so, and, and when we ever go down the Kashmir rabbit hole, it is a rabbit hole, but here's the, the, the nuts and bolts of what went down. Um, if you look at the Indian Independence Act of 1947, it says that the princely states were allowed to choose which dominion they were going to join. Um, they were impressed upon them that they have no advantages to remaining independent. By the time partition happened, there were three holdouts, Hyderabad, Junagadh, and Kashmir. Um, we, we know the history. Um, after a police action, India uh, took Hyderabad. Hyderabad won't remain independent. Junagadh signed an, an instrument of accession to join Pakistan. Junagadh was right in India. India uh, eventually uh, uh, secured Junagadh. Kashmir was the holdout. The Maharaja of Kashmir had a standstill agreement with Pakistan, which meant they were not to invade. Pakistan did invade. They were not non-state actors. The best work on this was done by Shuja Nawaz, the brother of Asif Nawaz, an army chief. Um, that uh, Pakistan-backed incursion uh, resulted in the first war of 47-48. Um, UN Security Council Resolution uh, 47 passed in 1948 held the following that Pakistan was supposed to demilitarize. Subject to that happening, India was also to demilitarize, allowing it to keep a defensive posture. And then upon the subsequent satisfaction of that taking place, there was supposed to be a plebiscite. Nowhere in that does that say that Pakistan, now, the Indians will say we have an instrument of accession. And technically, that entitles, uh, Pakistan, that entitles India to Gilgit-Baltistan. Only India, for perhaps bargaining purposes, some within the BJP, but no one of any consequence, um, has said that they really want to prosecute that demand. India is basically territorially status quo. It wants to finalize the, uh, the line of control into the international border. From my point of view, um, the, the territory was already ceded to China. It's not going to be unceded. Um, the United Nations has no interest in this, despite Pakistan's shenanigans to get the United Nations interested in this. If I were India, I would actually take advantage of this to, to actually uh, relinquish the demands to Gilgit Baltistan in exchange for Pakistan to recognize the LOC as the international border. I actually see this as an opportunity um, for India to use leverage to basically turn India's desire for the status quo into the legal reality. Hey, and I'm happy to engage further with uh, in the discussions um, about Chinese investments. Um, so, kind of generally speaking, I think if you look at the China-Pakistan Economic <coughs> Corridor, it's nothing particularly new. Um, China has been doing similar things across the world now. Africa has been the most notable location. We've seen infrastructure projects being done by China, with sort of uh, being discussed and analyzed uh, uh, in Africa for quite a long time. And, you know, China is involved in many other countries now. We are talking about Chinese energy investments and infrastructure investments in the UK now. So there's, there's this dimension. There's nothing particularly new, I think, about what China is doing there. Um, and why? Because Chinese enterprises do exhibit strengths in the infrastructure sector. I think we should say that. Um, they are known for their low cost. They kind of, that they can kind of provide low cost, efficient, uh, construction of infrastructure by bringing in usually their own workers from China. Is this considered efficient? It is 
most of the time, or often when they do these projects, they get the, they're the cheapest bidder. And that makes them attractive. Um, and uh, they have now global experience and expertise, and also ex uh, quite a lot of success doing this in China. Okay? So generally, one could be quite optimistic in a certain way about these infrastructure projects. Um, and China is institutionalizing this now in sort of the Belt and Road Initiative, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, and China's own development banks also providing loans um, to all kinds of uh, foreign, foreign projects. Um, this is tied to sort of its, the fact that it has three trillion of foreign, more than three trillion of foreign exchange reserves, um, which you could look at optimistically, um, but kind of the pessimistic side of it is that China is actually experiencing this kind of difficulties in its own domestic economy, and that you could um, worry about what these, what the implications might be of. Uh, China's economic slowdown on the ability to provide these loans and to provide further, further funding for this project. Okay, so it's not a surprise that China is also engaging in Pakistan. I think what is more peculiar, interesting about Pakistan is the, is the scale. So I think the scale is quite large. Um, the 46 billion that may be doubled uh, later on if, if, uh, the sort of, if the first batch of projects is successful. Um, and I think that is what makes Pakistan particularly interesting. So the talk, of, the question about this talk was, is it a game changer? Yeah. And um, so what? I'm, yeah. So is it a game changer? And I think to understand, is it a game changer for China or is it a game changer for Pakistan? I think that's what I'll focus on. We will not talk about much about other players. In the interest of time as well. And I think you need to look at the, at the inherent nature of both sides' goals. So my point of view is a bit that for China it's about energy security, it's about geopolitics. The nature of this goal is very different than Pakistan's goal, um, where it is um, more for economic development. So my point here really is it can be a win-win arrangement, so it can be a game changer for both, but it looks for me to be a bit more straightforward for China actually than it is for Pakistan. I think that's kind of the argument I'm trying to make, but I'm, I'm interested to hear views on this. Um, why do I think it's more of a game changer for China than for Pakistan, at least in, in the short term? Um, so for China, China's objectives, I think, are quite clear. They're quite easily spelled out here. They want, they want um, connectivity <coughs> via land to um, the Arabian Sea, to a location close to the Persian Gulf, Gulf and basically building these railroads uh, railways, railroads, and uh, pipelines more or less fulfills these objectives. It's a quite clear strategy what they need. They need these sorts of, this kind of connectivity to make, to make it work. And as I said, they're good at it, right? They're good at building these roads, um, sort of, yeah? Um, and, um, yeah, so what it means for China is building a 3,000 uh, stretch, 3,000 kilometer stretch of infrastructure. Um, and we see focus with it um, in the Guada port. We see the projects already being launched. I think that was talked about when I came in. Um, so there is focus on, on making these projects work. And if this connection to the Arabian Sea is being fulfilled, I think China can say it has an alternative route of transportation um, from going through the Malacca Straits, where, the, where transportation can still be blocked in, in the situations when when there's a crisis, when there's a dispute with the United States, um, and then it has now a very, very viable, a quite viable alternative route. It may not be cheaper, over land, transportation over land is complex, and still the resources have to go from Xinjiang to the east of China, but it is a viable alternative. Uh, and this, so, this has geo geopolitical meaning then for China, and um, is very important for its resource security. So I think that, I see that as relatively feasible. There are, of course, certain um, difficulties, um, probably two kinds. You need to have a good relation with Pakistan, and you need, that needs to be sustainable for the long term. Otherwise, you know, you'll be cut off again if the relations deteriorate. But that looks quite optimistic. China and Pakistan have had long-term, traditionally good relations 
And they have reinforced these also in 2015 um, um, with kind of um, agree, upgrading relationship to an all-weather strategic cooperation. The other, in, and that was mentioned, is internal security. Um, who will, who will, who will, um, who will provide security for the railroads and for the for the whole infrastructure, both in terms of when it's constructed, constructed, so when the Chinese workers are there, and when it's being operated, so the transportation can be disrupted. So these are big challenges. Of course, they're also being addressed uh, by by putting in special security forces and so on who are supposed to uh, to, to protect and these activities. So I think these challenges are rather technical. I mean, they're problematic, but they're, they're, in my view, not so big as the challenges for Pakistan, because I think for Pakistan, um, in order to eat, meet, meet its objectives, it's dealing with something very complex, which is, you know, how, how can I, how can I, how can, well, how can I make sure that our country or that Pakistan develops, which is a, you know, it's a very complex phenomenon, economic development. Just because someone invests money doesn't mean uh, you'll be a successfully developing. A lot of money has gone into projects and developing projects, development projects over, over decades, and um, often results are not achieved. So this is, I think, more difficult. Um, not sure how I want time. But there, there are benefits for economic development, of course, and from, resulting from the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Getting rid of China's chronic energy shortages, a major bottleneck, a lot of money goes into that. Then infrastructure connectivity, of course, this following, this being kind of modeled after China's own development model, which was emphasizing or had emphasized in the past construction of infrastructure, sort of the first, the first, the first activity that developing countries should do before anything else. Um, that's kind of mentality that exists in China and a strategy that is not necessarily um, um, in line with, with strategies that others have pronounced, which emphasize other aspects such as institutions uh, and that have to be in place, or good government and so on for development. So China, it's all about put the infrastructure in place and then um, sort out other issues later. So it kind of follows this, this approach. Um, and it'll enhance trade links, so one could, could hope that, China, that Pakistan could export more by having links into in its interior, road and rail links. Um, and it may lead to further domestic and foreign investment and the creation of uh, jobs. But there are numerous, numerous uncertainties, um, and I think these are these are quite you know these are quite serious. So, again, domestic instability, um, you know, terrorist groups, militias, obstruction, obstructing um, um, stability in, in in Pakistan, and obstructing the construction of the infrastructure. The government, yeah, the good, you know, is there a good government in Pakistan that can uh, do the best to support these projects? Um, what about, you know, corruption, <coughs> these questions? Um, where will these projects build? Are they built because of certain interests or because they they're economically have to be in certain areas rather than others from an economic perspective? There has been discussion about negative impact on local communities, pollution, there is discussion when I mean, you can criticize the quality of Chinese infrastructure is sometimes being criticized. Yeah? Um, haven't done research on this, cannot say much, but some try to argue about um, they are quick, they are efficient, but um, there's an issue with quality. So there, there's this argument as well. And then Chinese goods being, you know, first of all, you want to get rid of a trade deficit, but then maybe Chinese goods will just come into the market and, and there'll be, it, it, at worst, so the trade deficit with China will probably worsen rather than, um, than getting better as a result. And so there are these risks. Investment in hospitals, investment in schools, you know, these kinds of areas, are they being emphasized? Uncertainties about the road going through Kashmir. Um, and I think also the issue that always when Chinese workers do these activities that they are being done by Chinese workers. So they don't create employment uh, in Pakistan. They're not being <coughs> Large scale done by Chinese workers, um, uh, by, by Pakistanis. Um, so that's at least the strategy Chinese firms pursue in many, uh, in many places. So, this, yes, it can make a big difference to conclude, it can make a di big difference to Pakistan uh, in the medium term. Um, but I think China's, it's easier for China. I think China will, be the, will probably be 
a winner before Pakistan becomes a winner, I think. It's my, it's my kind of take on it. And so as a result, I think, you know, policymakers, if, if you want to conclude or learn something from my, from my talk, I would say the, the kind of what, what policymakers, academics, and so on should do is focus on Pakistan and really kind of think about, you know, how these funds, how, how one can make sure that these funds really benefit Pakistan, so that, that Pakistan really comes out of this as, um, you know, that this is really, the, that this big opportunity that people talk about for Pakistan, that this is really being realized. I think a lot of uh, strategic thinking and so on still needs to go into it. Well, thank you. That's probably the most optimistic contribution we've had so far this afternoon, so thank you very much indeed for that. Okay. Um, are there members of the panel who want to comment before bringing the... the, the, the Right. Um, yes. Well, I mean, I'll just add to that, which is that from the Pakistani point of view in terms of the economy, you always have to think about it in terms of opportunity costs. And one of the things that the other opportunity, the other alternative, which Pakistan has been following for a very long time, which is to be at the periphery of a, a U.S. Western-centric economic system in which it is not done very well because of the idea that aid is tied to security, that FDI and investment in general has been severely limited by a distaste for the country and, the, and, and sort of worries about security concerns and things like that, and the idea that there's now this World Trade Organization which cuts down trade barriers and things like that, but both India and Pakistan have not benefited very much when the West starts building up bilateral ties to countries like Korea and others. So one of the things to, to I think, amplify Jan's point is that Pakistan might not get as much out of it as China, but Pakistan may get more out of it than, than in the, its current space on the periphery of uh, Western-centric global political economy. And can I just add to that? I mean, I think the most important thing that Pakistan can get in the near term is energy generation. Absolutely. I and mean, that is like the biggest bottleneck. It can't be competitive, for example, with Bangladesh, because if you are going to run a textile factory, you have to have energy. You, you know this argument. So I'm, I'm, I agree with uh, your macro point, but I actually do think that this, this could be potentially important for Pakistan, at least in the... Now, one of my favorite examples was when Pakistan recently purchased some uh, railway carriages from China, and they were the wrong gauge. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have got little details, 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 but, you know, who cares about the details? But uh, the, the energy thing, I think, is really, really huge. And, uh, Pakistan needs that desperately, and that's something that the Chinese can do actually fairly quickly in the scheme of things. One thing I want you to bring into the mix, basically, again, probably each one of the uh, panel members can comment, is that CPAC in itself seemed like a very huge opportunity for Pakistan. 46 billion is by no means sort of you know, small change. And probably a country like UK is kind of you know, trying to get it's simply a power project built by China and more or less the same kind of quantum of basically money is involved. So we can see you know, the Chinese power at play across the globe at, at this point of time. So I think the, the CPAC is just one part of the one belt, one road philosophy which Chinese have been trying, sort of trying to talk, you know, uh, uh, sell around the globe and not and European Union has, has tied into it. So probably it would be a game changer as far as a Pakistani perspective is concerned. Secondly, I would like to draw the attention to the issue with the Balochistan, which we have discussed basically, and which is probably one of the issues which uh, I think Pakistan does comes across on the international forums quite a lot. And I would say uh, I'll go back to what happened in uh, at, at one point of time when Las Vegas was built up basically. I think people who don't join the bandwagon, they do lose out, basically. And the US has given that example, build it up and people will come. And that example, I think, works out across the globe that locals have to join in. And the insurgency in Balochistan has been mostly with the, with the feudal lords who have duped the local population to sort of you know, continue a struggle, which is very low intensity, but that has been the case. And I would like the panel to comment in terms of the power of the local feudals have waned out over the few last few years, in 60 years from now. And if you go down and you know knock on a mud hut and ask a Balochi, what do they want? Do they want that feudal law who is not allowing local infrastructure to develop? Or do they want Chinese to come and build up the local, local infrastructure? 
I would ask the panel, what do you think that, that uh, every Bellucci would answer? What I would try and do is resist every panel member answering every question. We won't get any questions <laughs> through. So if, if someone wants to start with an answer, yeah. Yeah. Chris, Chris is on. Yeah. There's a second one, and we'll see how we stand. So it's funny you say, I actually do a lot of survey work in Pakistan, and I'm working on a paper right now on what do Bellucci want. We have actually a very large sample. And actually, sir, you're just categorically wrong. Um, and, I, and I say that with about 4,000 below respondents under my belt. This idea that this is um, a problem that's led by a bunch of cantankerous warlords um, is very much a status narrative that it's really flawed. Um, I, I looked at, a, and these are using Pakistani statistics, by the way, whether we are looking at the percentage of Baloj versus Punjabis that use electricity in their home, whether they use wood or charcoal for cooking, Balochistan is the least developed province in the country, full stop. And, um, and this is unfortunately is a problem of pernicious endogeneity. Because of the low human capital, they don't have enough Baloj to teach in their schools and they have to bring people in from the outside. Um, just by virtue of gas being piped in from Balochistan versus Sindh, the government forces the Baloch to sell their gas at below market prices. Um, it is a fact that Balochistan produces, the gas that it produces, the majority of its gas is consumed outside of Balochistan. And the only time they get hookups is when a cantonment comes to the area. So this has nothing to do with cantankerous sardars. This has everything to do with the extractive politics of the state and the fact, and, and this also is how the state is organized, because Baloch represent, the, the entire province represents 5% of the population. So the real power in Pakistan lies in the National Assembly, right? So they are never going to have enough representation to, to redirect the resources towards that province, because that's, the, the National Assembly is on proportion, uh, proportionality. They have equal representation in the Senate, but the Senate has no power. So uh, this idea that these are just a bunch of Sardars, um, you know, uh, stirring up uh, rebellion is really does violence to the systematic recurring extractive policies of the state and it's compounding disadvantages that it has for this people. And rather than dealing with the distributional issues, what the state has chosen to do is at least five times use incredibly brutal force and no one covers this. I mean, the, we don't even know how many Baloch have been killed or disappeared. And I have to say, as an American, I know for a fact that my weapons are being used to do this. By the way, we have laws that prohibit this, but because my, my country lacks testicularity, we're not enforcing the Leahy Amendment. So I, I really want to push back on that really inaccurate characterization of what's happening. And I, I know Adnan knows lots more about this than I do.